Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Let's dive into today's conversation regarding life's myriad transitions and how we refine our responses in our relationships, our wellness, our households, our work, and in our practices. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today a powerhouse woman. She's an entrepreneur. She's a really passionate human who makes things happen. She is going to inspire you. Please buckle up and get ready. Put your dishes in front of you. Go for a walk. I want to introduce you today to the founder of Sahajan, Lisa Matam. Welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, you've been named by Profit Magazine as one of the top 10 emerging women entrepreneurs in Canada. You've been recognized by the Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce, which is a big deal, as Female Entrepreneur of the Year. You have become a thought leader in entrepreneurship and in resilience and the advancement of women and diversity. This is where you caught my attention You're a frequent commentator on these topics. You've been quoted in a variety of media, including Fast Company, The Globe, The Mail, CBC, Toronto Star. So I'd like to walk through each part of your bio and kind of get a sense for how that went, because you went from being like in the business world, in the corporate world, all the way to creating a set of products that has completely changed how I go to sleep at night, how I prepare myself for sleep, how I take care of myself. This is not a small thing. I've been with the same products for a very long time, and now I've shifted over to Sahajan. So let's go into the first sort of iteration of Lisa, shall we? Yes, I would love to. Okay. First venture was the Matam group. Am I saying your name correctly? Yeah, Matam, I go, but actually, <laughs> yeah, so it's Matam. Matam. That's the sort of English, uh, English, Anglicized version. It's the Anglicized version. version. And I actually just recently came back from a trip to India, to Kerala, and it was really special because I took my children for the first time, and there was like this extreme moment of pride and warmth as we were pulling in. They've never been to India, they've never been to Kerala. And we pull into my ancestral home and there's this big sign that says Matam, or as my family would say, Matam. So see, um, family says yes, Matam. I'm going with my Matam. Family. Okay, yeah. So my I'm going with Matam. Matam. Yeah. Um, you are from Kerala, so your kids being there was very special. And uh, was there a reason why they'd never been there or was it just like COVID and no travel? Well, so my parents were raised there and they moved here right before they had kids. And so I grew up visiting and always having a sense of connectivity to India because my parents moved. All of my father's siblings stayed there. Um, So we didn't have a lot of relatives growing up, but they were also new immigrants forging a new life. And so the opportunity to go back and forth, you know, we didn't go a lot because of what it would take to get there. But I went and I always had this sense of connectedness. But it was when I went in my 20s that my relationship with India sort of changed because I could see it in a new light. And I really started to connect with it as a place of home. And I could really see like, you know, for us being, it was really special to go there. And before I got married, I went when I got married. And then I had this trepidation about bringing the kids and the distance and I used to get really sick when I visited and then COVID came. And so there was always like something that got in the way. And then this time I was like, it's time. Like they need to go. They need to go and see this. So yes, Mm -hmm. yes. Big, Mm -hmm. big moves. That's really smart of you. What caught my eye particularly about your bio is when you co-authored a report called Mom's the Word, How Organizations Can Change the Impact of Motherhood on Career Success. Mm -hmm. Um. You grew a consulting firm with clients all over the world, literally Canada, U.S., Latin America, UAE. Mm -hmm. You have equipped Fortune 500 companies like Walmart, of all things, the tools to keep women in the C-suite and advance diversity in the workplace. This is like a very big deal. (laughs) Thank you. No, I see it as a real game changer, a policy changer. 
So this report, Mom's the Word, How Organization Can Change the Impact of Motherhood and Career Success, I want to talk about this. Yeah, this is a really special opportunity. So to give you a little bit of background, prior to consulting, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I, I worked for a short period of time in the U.S. I was you know, part of a very big organization. And when I was within the organization I was involved, they would have like a women's leadership initiative. And they were doing a lot of things to you know, advance women, but I could see it unfold in my eyes. Like I was a, you know, I was fairly young. I was in my twenties and I had big goals, but I could see ahead of me, there were fewer and fewer women in these very senior roles. And I always actually remember they had a very significant person come from like the global worldwide organization to speak at our women's leadership initiative. And I remember you had the opportunity, you could ask her any question that you wanted. And one of the questions came around family and she had said, well, I have to be honest, you know, I didn't meet um, my partner, you know, at the right time in my life. And so I never had children. And so she said, so I will admit that I don't know if I could be where I am had I met the right person at the right time and had I endeavored to have children. And I remember just really taking a big pause when I heard that. Wow. Because I thought to myself, I was in my 20s and I was like, oh, I want to have kids, you know, if I can and if the stars align and all that stuff. And I was like, does that mean that I just can't, I just can't do the other things? Like I can't go do the big things that I aspire to. And so when I started consulting, I hadn't initially planned on working in the area of the advancement of women or of diversity. It sort of, people kept pushing me back there. I think part of it was that I was consulting and I was a woman of color and people would be like, can you do this work? Can you do this work? But because it had always been particularly around equity and women's equity had always been part of my life. I was gender equity chair in university. I was all of these things. I was like, yeah, I can do this work and I can do it very meaningfully. Um, and so I started to do all this work at Walmart and in crown corporations and oil and gas corporations. And this interesting thing came up. I met an author, her name is Reva Seth. She was launching a book called The Mom Shift. And she was a a lawyer previously. And what she did was she interviewed 500 mothers and she basically captured their stories. And what she wanted to do was basically debunk the myth that children were an inhibitor to career success. And so she interviewed all this women. But what she intentionally did was where she had one woman who had children in their 20s and then really accelerated her career. And the next woman would have children in her 40s and talk about what that meant. And so I met her during this time. And what we realized was her book was this really beautiful guidepost for women who were embarking on having children. But there wasn't a lot that was in place to really help organizations support mothers when they are mothers. And, you know, we have these beautiful narratives and and sometimes debatable narratives, depending on who you talk to around lean in and all these kinds of things. But we were like, there's not a transparent conversation about what it's really like to be a mother in the workplace. And it's interesting because now that we're in a post-COVID world, I actually think it allowed us to show what our real lives look like. I used to say to my kids, even when I started to hodge in my Ayurvedic skincare line, I remember sometimes I would pick them up but someone really important would call in the line. And I would say like, you can't speak. Like if you have a thought, just say it in your mind or like no breathing, like no making sounds. And now in a post COVID world, you know, if I happen to be in the car when someone calls, I'm okay with it now, but we weren't having those transparent conversations. And so what we were trying to do with that, with the research is we dug into her research and we were like, there's a lot that organizations can do to be more supportive. And I use the word transparent a lot, but to be more transparent about what it is to be a mother in an organization, because the reality is, is we need to do so much more to advance women in general, but the subsection of mothers is different because the pull on your time is different or everything that you're navigating is different as is someone, you know, who's maybe navigating aging parents or other things, but it's a different conversation. And I think what corporations have often done is they want to include women and mothers and they want to include them. So they put up these great banners or you know, make these great daycare policies, but they don't actually transparently tell you how it's going to work. You know, one of our recommendations at the time, and this was a few years back, was about really being honest with what it would take. So because one of the things we heard was women who wanted to be partners, for example, in law firms or in consulting firms, they would get one message, which was you can be flexible and you can still take your kids to soccer and you could do all these things. But there was like another inherent message from their direct managers, which was, 
well, if you really want to be a partner, you've actually got to build this many hours and you've got to be available for travel and you've got to be available for clients. And so like one of our biggest recommendations was just be honest because then it allows you, you know, to make a decision or it allows you to come home. If you have a partner to say, in order for me to get here, this is what it's going to take. And how do I navigate around that? So it was a really important conversation. I think the other takeaway I would recommend to any organization who's looking to really advance women or we're looking to really advance mothers, and I say this till today and it sounds so simple, is to find relatable role models. So if I go back to my story of this woman who's like, I never met the right partner at the right time. And so, you know, her message was an honest one and I appreciated it. But mothers told us they needed to see other people who were doing it. Like they wanted to hear on a panel, not the C-suite level woman who never had kids or not the person who, you know, had maybe potentially a lot of privilege or whose systems seemed so out of range for them. They wanted to see people who were in the muck of it. Like they'd rather hear someone who was maybe two levels above them, but really explaining like, how do they work and how do they get their kids to their activities and how do they make dinner if they're responsible the for granular. dinner. They wanted the granular and they wanted the relatability. Yeah. They wanted to be able to see someone who they thought, oh, that person is like me. If she can do it, I can do it. Mm. And I think that's a consistent feeling that you and I, you know, talk about entrepreneurship. Like people want to see entrepreneurs or whoever it is that they can relate with and say, hey, I'm not that much different from that person. So if they can do it, I can do it. And that's Which is why I have you do. here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is exactly mm -hmm. why. Because so many women that I know, they have such good ideas. Mm -hmm. And they just can't follow through because they don't think it's relevant. Yes. And all the ideas are relevant. All the ideas are relevant. And there's so many different paths to get there. And I think that's a message we don't hear in society. We read books from people who are incredible but their story sometimes or the support systems they have or whatever it is just aren't relatable. Right. Mm -hmm. So after this time, what year are we talking about here? Oh, oh gosh. This was going down. So that was probably like 2013, 2014, somewhere around there. No. So almost 10 years ago. Yeah. How old are like, you? How old are you? A hundred. No, <laughs> I'm in my late forties. Mm -hmm. Nice. You're not that old. Mm -hmm. I'm older than you, and I feel like I'm in my 30s. I know. I do, too. Actually. Seriously. I feel that way all yeah. the time. There's so much Let's more to do. Let's just rewrite that whole narrative. Mm -hmm. Forget that whole narrative of being old. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's like you're getting wiser, smarter, yes. easier to manage everything in your life, and mm -hmm. more beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yes, but I do believe yeah. all of those things. I do. And, yeah, and we it's have really true. It is. And the lived experience, like if I look back at my career, you know, as I told you, I started in pharma and then I was in consulting for a number of years. And then I had the idea for Sahajan, which I started working on. Like, I think I was writing that paper while I was also working on Sahajan. It really, for me, set the foundational steps to be able to create another company, which, you know, I have such admiration for people who start companies when they're 18 or 22, but for you know, people who are like, I'm 40 or I've already had a career. Like there's so much more we can still do. And those lived experiences allow us to be able to do it. Also, your 40s are when you finally get to know yourself and see yes. what you're capable of. Yes. This is the time, actually. Mm -hmm. So many great things happened in my 40s. And now into my 50s, like I'm much more brave and powerful, I feel. Mm -hmm. I'm much and more And also brave. softer. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm much yeah. more brave, but I'm... Uh, what's the word someone used to describe me the other day? It's like, you're a very calm person. And I said, you should see me on the inside sometimes. But it's like you learn the wisdom of time allows you to say, like, I can get through this. This is going to be hard, but I can get through this. And time is so arbitrary. Mm -hmm. It really is. So arbitrary. Mm -hmm. You founded Sahajan in what year? So I will say launched the products towards the end of 2015 but had the idea two years before this uh, because I was still working. I was still consulting when I started to work on it. And being former pharma, I took a really pragmatic approach to starting a skincare line. So I hired chemists and I paid for lab space because I had this really specific approach in my mind. And I also didn't come from beauty. And so I was really just doing something brand new. And so taking the only approach that made sense, that took time, but it was great. What's cool is that you took what could have been a questionable pursuit 
pharma is so questionable right now for so many of us Mm -hmm. and made it into a stepping stone for a super high quality suite of products that I just can't even believe how much I love the routine at night. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I can't. I'm so glad to hear that. It's so wonderful. So let me just tell our listener first. Listener, S-A-H-A-J-A-N. S-A-H-A-J-A-N. That's the name of the company, Sahajan. I'm going to give you a code that you can use for a really nice gift and discount from Lisa. But to start with, as you're looking at the website, you have been featured in Vogue Paris, O, the Oprah Magazine, so proud of you, Forbes, you're distributing in Canada and in the U.S. Mm-hmm. The retailers that you work with, such as Indigo, the Detox Market, the Bay, like that's a really big deal. Sephora, you were selected as the only Canadian for Sephora's inaugural Beauty Accelerator. That's so cool. The Atelier named you Entrepreneur of the Year in 2021. You know, this is a really big deal. Your leadership in beauty and sustainability is something that probably at least one of our listeners including me, are really inspired by. This is a big deal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hearing it through your ears, I'm like, oh, wow, I feel really proud in this moment. Take it in. (laughs) Yeah. You should. You You know what? At the end of the day, and James is like, how long are you going to be? And I'm like, well, I'm going to be a while. (laughs) Sorry. I start with that cleansing oil. It's an amazing formulation. Oh, it's incredible. It feels like lotion, but it I can feel it clearing out my pores. Yes. Yes. It's so big, especially when I travel. I bring it in my little travel containers. It's the best. From there, I go to the toner. Mm-hmm. I had to go and buy a whole stack of those cotton pads again because I haven't used them in so long. But the toner is serious. Like I can see when I was traveling recently with my son, the dirt coming off of my face. Yes. It's amazing. So clearly. It? Mm-hmm. Yes. We're going to talk about the ingredients in a moment for our listener. The serum follows that, which is like this really cool kind of, it feels moisturizing, but it also feels like it's clearing the way somehow. And it's brown and it's like deliciously scented. Uh, That goes on after the toner dries. I like take my time. Really. And then James is calling, hey, babe. And I'm like, one more step. (laughs) It's the um, beauty oil Mm -hmm. that slays me. Slays me. The smell is so relaxing. Mm -hmm. I live in the high desert, so I'm up at like 7,800 feet. And the moisture that I get from that beauty oil is wild how emollient and delicious it is. So I wanted you to hear that with your own ears because you've changed my routine, which nobody else had done in many, many years. Thank you. You know, when I hear that, it makes me feel, interestingly, you know, we talked a little bit about my career and working in pharma and then going to consulting. And when I was getting ready to launch the skincare line, my good friend who I wrote this paper with, I remember having a day where I said to her, I just got to say this out loud. And she said, what's that? And I said, do you think that like, it's just a little, I don't know what the right word is. I don't even know what word I chose in the moment, but I was kind of like, I don't know if the word was superficial or trite or something, but I said that, you know, I've gone from like being, doing all these like really heart centered, like very passionate things. And I continue to be passionate about the advancement of women. And now I'm launching a beauty line, which, you know, in some ways there's no shortage of beauty lines. Like if you're going to Sephora, you're going to Credo, you're going to the detox market, like there's no shortage here. Do you think that I'm almost like doing less than what I should be doing to contribute back to the world. And I remember her saying to me two things, like one was basically what you just said right now, which is like, you are taking these ingredients, you know, from the Indian subcontinent, from Ayurveda, things that people haven't been exposed to before. And you're giving them the opportunity to transform their skin. And at the end of the day, how we feel about ourselves is so important to how we carry ourselves during the day. But then she also said to me, here's the other way to think about it is go take this business and go blow it up, you know, go do it really, really well. And then for one second, imagine the platform you'll have to do all the things that you're so passionate about. Like now you'll be standing on a stage talking about the advance of women, but imagine the people who are going to be in the audience. And I thought, oh yeah, you're right. So you just like encapsulated the first reason that she and I talked about that day was that ability to 
to transform someone's skin and and to give them that feeling of both being nurtured, but also feeling great about how they look. That's right. Mm-hmm. The link that I want to give to our listener is sahajan.com forward slash my name, Elena Brower. One word. Your code for 20% off is all caps, Elena, E-L-E-N-A. I just said that like my mom would have said it. It's um, funny. I was like, do you say Elena? <laughs> I don't really. I say it. This is like Mother's Day vibes, like coming up. I'm Elena right now. Usually I say Elena. I want to talk about the pollution fighting first in the cleansing oil and what are the ingredients that make this happen because I am always a fan of educating our listener. And let's talk about that. I know that you have Moringa. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this plant and the magic of this plant first. So Moringa is an incredible plant and we chose it specifically for the cleansing oil. And to give you a sense, like that cleansing oil was almost a year in formulation. It took us so long to get it to that place where it had the feeling that you describe of like being both silky smooth, but also cleaning. But Moringa was critical because, so it's a green leafy plant. Some people might add it to their smoothies. My parents use actually, so they use the leaves and they sometimes add it to like a lentil or a dal dish, but there's actually a part of the moringa plant. My parents call it drumstick. It looks like a thicker, almost like a little branch. And my parents would add it to like some very specific dishes that they grew up on. And they're usually lentil based and it's incredibly nutritious. So it's like, high in vitamins. I think it has like vitamins A through E. It's like high in antioxidants and all these things. And so when you take the plant and you extract the oil, it has like all of these micronutrients, it has antioxidants, it has vitamins. But what they've actually been able to show is that it has this incredible ability. They call it anti-pollution cleansing. So basically it pulls pollution out of the skin. And in developing countries, Moringa seeds are often used to help to cleanse water. You know, if you take water and you put the Moringa seeds in, the Moringa seeds will actually help to pull the toxins out of the water to make the water drinkable. And so it's a really fascinating advance that's happening in creating drinkable water. And so what cosmetically they found is if you take the oil, it actually has this ability to pull pollution. And I read some wild stat that was like 90% of us in the world, it was like a WHO stat, live in areas that are considered over polluted. So we always think of like pollution is just if you're living in the city, like you're in Manhattan, (laughs) you know, you're walking by trucks that are smoking in your face, but we're actually because of the way we've engaged with the earth created so much pollution that we're all living with this pollution on our skin and we need to be able to pull it out. And you know, my sister as an example wears zero makeup. Not that she needs to wear makeup, but I always laugh because like I had to get her into a bit of a routine and she was like, who cares? I don't wear makeup and I put Vaseline intensive care on my face. And I was like, yeah, but <laughs> you're out and about all but day. But that's petroleum. But that's hmm. petroleum. Exactly. And I often say to people, there's only three things you could do is like use the cleansing oil, take all that, you know, basically like the daily yuck off your face. What's nice about an oil for your makeup wearing listeners, because I'm a makeup winner, is oils are the best at actually breaking down makeup because like dissolves like, just like basic science. And so you need a cleansing oil to like break down the makeup. You can actually put lipstick on your hand and and put the cleansing oil on and it'll actually break down the makeup. Only oils and balms can break down SPF. So if you're wearing SPF daily, you need to remove that from your skin to like actually let the skin breathe and take off that barrier. But Moringa is this incredible ingredient and you'll often see it used. We use it in the beauty oil and we use it in the cleansing oil. In the beauty oil, it's in a, a higher concentration because it's considered a universal oil. So it can be for dry skin, acneic skin. You know, if you feel like your skin is like sometimes oily, sometimes dry, it's considered a universal oil. And it's many of us and it has that cleansing benefit, but also that deeply nourishing benefit as well. It's an amazing ingredient and I consume it. I do like having just come back from India, I was like, oh, I need to shake out my fridge again. But I've started to go and buy the leaves and add it to things just because it's so good for you. Wow. Mm-hmm. The um, the toner by what I think is a real balancing act, the toner has fruit extracts in it. Mm-hmm. 
And the smell of this toner is unbelievable. Like I said, I went and bought a whole stack of organic cotton pads and I'm having the best time. I feel like I'm back in my teenage years. The fruit extracts, orange, lemon, bilberry. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about their capacity to exfoliate the skin as a nice counterpoint to the cleansing oil. Yes. So traditionally in Ayurveda, fruit extracts, papaya, lemon specifically, have always been used to exfoliate. And, you know, my best friend, even my dad has these great stories. Like my dad has this great story of my grandmother, like cutting a lemon in half and putting it on her face, like just like holding it by the rind and and putting it on her face because traditionally it was the way that you kept your skin glowing and soft because of the acids within those fruits. And if you look in the Vedic texts, or you speak to an Ayurvedic practitioner and you say to them, you know, what do I do if I have hyperpigmentation? They'll tell you a number of ingredients, but they'll always say like, you need the fruit acid of a papaya or a lemon or an orange to help to exfoliate the skin. And so that acts in the toner. And what's nice about it in the toner formulation is it's very light. And so it's enough that you can use the toner daily for exfoliation. You won't get a tingling sensation. You know, sometimes when people think of exfoliants, they think of like redness or burning or tingling. This is very light, gentle. You know, you describe having recently been on a trip and and looking at the cotton pads. If you look at your cotton pad and it's gray, that's usually dead skin cells coming off of the skin. And so if you think about your skincare, you want to pull off any sort of dead skin cells that are there so that when you go to put in your serums, your oils, your creams, you've now created this great canvas for things to actually absorb. All the dead skin cells, the dirt, any of that kind of stuff is sitting there. The skincare just sits on top of it. So the exfoliation is extremely important and really lightly done. And like you with the balance toner, I find the fragrance, because we don't put fragrance in a lot of things, but we did with the toner. And it's a naturally derived fragrance, a very light blend of essential oils. There's some honeysuckle in there. And For me, actually, the toner, probably the most of all the products, but I just find it like, I know it's working on my skin because I can see it on the cotton pad, but I also just have a moment of like, oh, what a great ritual. Like, what is so nice? It's so nice. It's almost like I don't want to get too dramatic about it, but it's almost like this little meditative moment. Like, I have a friend who tells me she actually keeps it by her bedside and she puts a little on her hand because she just wants to smell it before she goes to bed. So sweet. Mm -hmm. I wonder, would the toner work on the tops of my hands that are now getting age spots on them? For sure. For sure. For sure. I'm a big advocate of SPF, so I would say like SPF on your hands, but it would definitely work. And we have a brightening mask, uh, which has turmeric. It has holy basil, which is also known as Tulsi. It has hemp seed oil, and then it has the same complex, the same fruit-based complex, but a little bit stronger. And you can use that on hyperpigmentation. You can use that on, um, you know, melasma, which are the spots. You can use that just to get a general renewal of the skin. It's incredible. And um, you can mask your hands 100%. I'm totally, that's in my next cart. Beautiful. The brightening mask. The serum, though, is kind of a star. And I described it as this sort of brownish, gorgeous, super smoothing serum. It has three ingredients that I really want to know about. The first is triphala, which I know is sort of commonly used for digestive support in Ayurveda. The second is gotu kola, which, if I'm understanding correctly, is has a firming capacity. And then hyaluronic acid, which most of us know is really about hydration, and also elasticity of the skin. Can we talk about these three ingredients, Miss uh, Scientist? <laughs> I would love to. I can talk favorite. ingredients. So triphala, to your point, I'm actually taking a little bit of triphala right now because my digestion's a little off. What makes triphala so amazing is it's this blend of three fruits. So it's uh, amla, which a lot of people are familiar with, which is the Indian gooseberry. 20 times the amount of vitamin C is in orange, a really, really beautiful ingredient. But it also has two other ingredients, babithiki and harithiki. So in traditional Ayurveda, the combination of the three, it's almost one of the, you know, when you say like the sum of the parts is greater than the individual, you know, on their own. In Ayurveda, the combination of the three is very powerful. 
It's used for digestive fire if you're consuming it. Some people, again, will add the powders to different things to, again, enhance the antioxidants, all the stuff that it has in it, which is it's a pretty amazing ingredient. What's neat about it on the skin, again, is one, the idea of triphala. And when we first started working on the products, we were working with these two Ayurvedic doctors in Kerala on the formulations. And one of the things that the Ayurvedic doctors recommended when they said triphala is they actually said, but they're seeing that modern Ayurveda, particularly in beauty, uh, one, we're all looking for this, what we would think of as like tridoshic or like formulations that help everybody because it's a lot to say like, oh, this is, we know a lot about our skin. We can say it's dry. We can say it's oily. It's combo. It's red today. It's this today. And what triphala is, is this ingredient that can help not just one thing, but a number of things because of the blend. Sort of adaptogenic. It is an adaptogen. Exactly. It's an adaptogen. Well, <laughs> that's probably the word I should have picked from the beginning, but it is, it's an adaptogen. So it does all of these things. It's like one of nature's first adaptogens. And then what's amazing is, is if you think about how we traditionally buy skincare, we tend to buy vitamin C serums and we buy them because vitamin C has this ability to help to prevent free radical damage. You know, it's powerful in antioxidants and it brightens the skin. So now you've got this very natural source of vitamin C comes from these fruits. Again, Amla has 20 times the amount of vitamin C as an orange. And we traditionally are often buying vitamin C serums with oranges. And so now you've got very high powered vitamin C being delivered in this beautiful formulation. So um, that's where the brown color comes from in the formula. The brown color comes from triphala. If you ever buy triphala from the store or a powder or a pill, you'll see that it's brown. But it doesn't leave a color behind on the skin because of its absorption into the skin. And it, so it's pretty incredible. But it's this beautiful ingredient. And a little funny story about the serum and actually our creme riche that have this color is, you know, when we first did it at the lab, we took it to a much bigger lab to say, okay, we're ready to actually, you know, build this or make this into a product. And they said, well, do you want us to bleach it white? And we were like, no, why would we ever? And they said, oh, do you know, there's so many creams that have color on them, but most people don't want a cream with color. They want a white cream. And so we just add ingredients to make it white. And I was like, no, like, no. Oh God. I know. No, thank you. No, thank you. Um, oh, thanks. And that's what your skin is craving, right? It's craving the natural ingredients and that's what your skin is absorbing. So Triffle is incredible for the skin. Really, really good for the skin. Go to Cola is also known as Brummy. Um, it's like Latin name is Centella Asiatica. So sometimes other brands will call it Centella or they'll call it Sika, but it's trade name is Gotikola. Brahmi is incredible. So what's fascinating is in the Vedic text, and not that I'm telling people they need to defy their age, but if you look at, if you actually look at thousands, 5,000 years ago, what was recorded in the Vedic text as being, the word translates from Sanskrit to being like age defying they talk about Brahmi. And one of the ingredients that the royals of India used to stay young, and they didn't fully know why, but they knew that the application of Brahmi was helping to keep the skin firm. It was helping to minimize you know, the appearance of fine lines. And what we now know in science is that the same ingredient, and you'll often see it now used in over-the-counter scar creams, because it's being studied in wound healing, because what it actually does is it stimulates the production of collagen. And so, you know, people often say, well, I want to consume collagen, right? Like I want to drink collagen. I want to do all these things. And, you know, the data is still a little bit shaky about whether or not, you know, we get a direct effect from taking collagen pills or drinking collagen. What the data actually shows with this ingredient, go to cola or brummy, is that when the skin absorbs it, it stimulates the production of your own collagen. And so it helps in wound healing. It's really cool. So if you have like potentially old acne scarring, like I have a lot of hyperpigmentation on my face from years of, you know, whether I had a little bit of acne or just like being in the sun a lot and you get hyperpigmentation, I found it's really helped to bring my skin back. And so that's why that's such an important ingredient. And then hyaluronic acid, as you said, you know, it's nature's moisture magnet. We make hyaluronic acid ourselves in our skin, but as we get older, we generate less and less. And so 
it holds a thousand times its weight in water. It really brings water back into the skin. And so what's neat about what we were endeavoring to do with the serum, which I believe we've accomplished is like really taking again, these old world ingredients and modernizing them and providing them in modern science in a way to say like here, now you can get one complete serum. And so this is one of the ones where like we talked about my old background in pharma my instinct, because I was kind of thinking to myself, because now, you know, you know, the timeline. So this would have been like almost 10 years ago when I came up with this idea. And I was like, why did it take me so long to get here with my skincare? I'm like, why am I not using clean skincare? I grew up in a house where like my dad made us do yoga when it wasn't cool, where we were like meditating and chanting when I was like, please just make pancakes. You know, I was like, and at the time I was like, no, I remember telling my dad, like, no meditating in the morning or lighting candles, like make when people sleep over, like make pancakes, you know, do what everybody else's dad does. And now it's like the biggest gift he's added to my life. Um, I was like, why did it take me so long to get here? My hypothesis was, because even though intuitively we know we should go clean with our skincare, when we buy it, we buy it because we want results. And so what I said- No, we buy it because we're being fed images of things that are supposed to be beneficial and Mm. desirable. Part of the transition from being a victim of advertising to being an educated consumer is this- shift from being a victim of those images to knowing what you really need. Mm -hmm. And I think just knowing what you want for your skin, you know, we look at our skin and we think, oh, it feels like we do with our digestion, right? Like it's feeling raw. And we can often look and say, well, it's because I did this, or I've been in the sun, or I've spent too much time in the pool, or I've gone on this trip and my skin feels out of whack. And so we know when we want to put our skin back in balance. But sometimes I think inherently we think, okay, we've got to go to these other things. It's your point, like what we're being fed with advertising or like these complex molecules. And so what I wanted to show people was you could get the answers to those questions with these ingredients. And so the serum was one of those examples where we were one of the first clean brands, if I can use the word clean, to actually run clinicals, like cosmetic clinicals on our products, because I wanted people to see, like you could use the serum. And, you know, the results were really clear, like in six weeks, 94% of people had a minimization in fine lines, you know, people had a statistically significant difference in the glow or the luminosity on their face. And I did that with intention because I wanted people to see like, you don't need to go to these like triple molecule complexes, or you don't need to go to things that aren't natural to get the result that you want that helps you keep your skin in balance. Cause that's really what Ayurveda is about, right? It's about keeping you in balance. And so to me, the Radiant Serum, the Nourish Creme Riche, which I know I need to get you to try because I think you're going to absolutely adore. But to me, it's about bringing your skin back to its healthiest center. It's not about looking like anybody else, but it's like looking like your best you as you see it. And I think that's what the, the purpose of our products are. I feel that in my face. And I can tell immediately now, especially after using your products, I can tell right away when something isn't natural. I can mm-hmm. smell it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you it's can a good feel it. education. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you can feel it, of course. Mm-hmm. Ayurveda is the science of life. That's the definition of that word. For our listener, this is thousands of years old, these practices, these ingredients, the way in which Ayurveda is used to literally balance your body from the inside out. And here we have this incredible, super well-wrought line balancing your skin, the biome of your skin from the outside in as well, which is huge. The beauty oil is the last one that I wanted to talk about today, although I do live for the body oil. Oh, it's so And the damn, the lip balm is just out of control. The lip balms are great, yeah. I just can't, I can't handle it. I can't handle the (laughs) lip balm. I but the, the beauty oil has familiar ingredients to me and to probably a fair number of our listeners. It has the moringa oil, 90 nutrients or so, vitamins A and D. It has the hemp seed oil, which is also super nourishing, um, soothes dryness, helps to lock in any moisture that's on your skin. And then frankincense, which is like one of my favorite ingredients of all time, obviously. And I would love for you just to talk about the choices that you made to have the hemp seed oil and the frankincense in there. Mm -hmm. So we make 
every product actually in consultation with an Ayurvedic doctor or an Ayurvedic practitioner, because that authenticity is really important to me. And sometimes like in true transparency, sometimes they'll come back and say, okay, we almost reverse engineer. So I'll say like, I'm looking for something that's going to like with the beauty oil, you know, be balancing for all skin types. I'm looking for something that's going to help to lock in moisture. I'm looking for something that's going to help to balance redness. I'm looking for something that's going to give sustained hydration. But for anybody who wants to just use oils, but also wants some properties that are going to help, um, you know, as they age the way that they want or to age on their own terms, they'll come back and give me ingredients. And sometimes I'll say like, oh, we can't use that because it's either not available or it's not as viable here in North America. So one from a truth uh, source, that's how we start the formulation process. Um, But with this, the ingredients were so important because, so with hemp seed oil was really important in this one because what hemp seed offers, which is really interesting, it offers a really good balance to redness and it offers a sustained hydration. And one of the things that I learned is that in North America, we have My numbers, again, might be wrong, but something like 80% of people believe their skin to be sensitive and we struggle with a lot of redness. And part of that, again, is balancing from the inside out. And the other thing is, is like we're exposed to the weather and as we're experiencing climate change and as we're experiencing just like the seasonal changes and all that kind of stuff, we experience a lot of redness on our skin. And so the hemp seed helps to balance that. And then the frankincense and the Ayurvedic doctors always tell us at which amounts to put it in because frankincense, if you overdo frankincense, like if you go buy frankincense from the store and put it on your face, I do not recommend that because it's too strong and it could actually impact your skin. But Ayurveda is also about blending things. And so frankincense and the right amount, it's the oil of royalty. And again, why do the royals use it? It's not just because it smells incredible, because it has this incredible ability in the hyperpigmentation. It helps with, again, the minimization of fine lines, but again, delivers that in a really delicate, beautiful formulation. And what's interesting about the beauty oil is some people open it and they tell me, oh, it doesn't smell like anything. And other people open it. You can just smell a little bit of that frankincense and it just delivers this beautiful experience and an interesting you know, geeky, nerdy thing that you need to know about oils is oils do lock in and protect. So the reason in Asian cultures, even in European cultures, we use oil sometimes over lotions or we use both. Like sometimes you'll see people will put on like a serum and then an oil on top or a cream and then an oil on top is because oils actually create this barrier on your skin. And so they lock in and protect. They don't just offer moisture to the top layer of the skin. They create this beautiful barrier. So now If you're wearing makeup, you can put on makeup. If you're wearing SPF, which I recommend you put your SPF on, but nothing else is penetrating that. So it creates this gorgeous barrier to help protect the skin, which is what you want. It's just an incredible product. The experience that I've had, as I said earlier to our listener, with incorporating this into my nighttime routine, which is far longer than it used to be, but the cleansing oil, the toner, the serum, and then the beauty oil. I haven't even tried the Nourish Creme Riche yet, but I can't wait to try it. These four products have literally changed my skin. I wake up in the morning and my skin looks different. It looks more hydrated and more nourished. And like I said, I live in such a dry place. These products are all cruelty-free. There is no added fragrance in any of these products. They are all vegan, as well. That's actually that true? not true. No. So I do want to jump in and let you know that. So there is, as I mentioned in a couple of them, so the toner is one and the serum is another where we've added in like some naturally derived fragrance, but it's natural. So you can feel comfortable that it's natural and it's sustainable. And then what you will see is in the lip karma and the cleansing oil, there is beeswax. So in Ayurveda, Ayurveda actually uh, reveres honey and beeswax for its ability to help to strengthen and heal the skin. It's funny, as I told you, I just came back from India and I was at my aunt's house and she'd given us honey water, which is like the first time I had it. And then she took us outside and they have bees in the house and they pull their own. Honey is considered a very therapeutic, a very important ingredient as is beeswax. So you will see that in the lip karma specifically in the essential cleansing oil. And it's a the great, lip karma's out in of the control. lip karma, yeah. And it's a great ingredient to avoid using some of the other emollients you see in non-clean beauty. It's a great ingredient. And the Lip Karma is also linked to a supportive initiative for Plan International. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah. So this, again, you're starting to see like my life come full circle, but we work with Plan International. They have a campaign. It's called Because I'm a Girl. And they have a a campaign that focused just on girls in developing countries because they, in their work, have shown like in many developing countries, there's millions of girls who don't get to go to school every day just because they're girls. But when you engage a girl to go to school, she not only has the ability to navigate her own future, she can change the trajectory of her family's life, her community's life. And often, and I've seen this, you know, even in documentaries on India or different places, you know, when families are making a choice, they sometimes make the choice not to educate the girls in the family, which to me is heartbreaking and detrimental to society. And so with the Because I Am a Girl campaign, every time somebody buys a Lip Karma, we send a girl in a developing country to school for a day. Our business, it was in its infancy in some ways, you know, we're still a growing business. And I remember I said to an advisor, like, oh, we've got to do some social impact with our business. And he kind of said to me, he said, just grow your business. Like right now you just need to grow the business of the business. And then you can worry about all of that stuff later and you can do it. I promise. And I was like, even if we start by donating a hundred dollars, because we've only sold a hundred lift cards, I'm okay with that or whatever it is. Like, even if we can't do these things, we need to do them. And so I started researching after that. Like I didn't know what it would take and I didn't know what the cost would be. And I didn't know, you know, he kept saying to me, Lisa, you're giving away your margins, you know, like you're not making money. And I was like, that's okay. Like if you take care of your values, the rest will take care of itself. (laughs) Margins are secondary to values I found. Yes. Yeah. And it's an important lesson. Mm -hmm. So the link, our listener, Sahajan, S-A-H-A-J-A-N dot com forward slash Elena Brower, spelled out one word. Lisa has very generously given us, our uh, community, the Practice You podcast, a code. And the code is all caps, E-L-E-N-A. And that means 20% off the entire site. It's crazy and beautiful and generous and wonderful and I just want to say one more thing about the Lip Karma. I put it on before I record for Yoga Glow or for any other sort of like hour-long mentorship, live gathering, anything. That Lip Karma stays on my lips for at least an hour, if not more. And at the end, I'm always just amazed to put my lips together and still feel it. Mm -hmm. It's so good. So So good. good. So good. Oh, my Mm -hmm. goodness. I look forward to watching how this all unfolds. I really commend the commitment that you've made to your values, to linking up with girls who need to go to school. I commend the fastidiousness with which you've formulated all of these ingredients. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming my way, for including me in your work. I'm really grateful and um, I'm really proud of you as a fellow woman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mm.